From New York, this is Democracy Now! The president of Haiti, Jovenel Moise, has been assassinated in an armed attack on his home. Haiti's first lady was also injured. For months, Haitians have been protesting the U.S.-backed president for refusing to leave office when his term ended in February. We'll get the latest. Then, Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones has rejected a tenure offer at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, her alma mater, to join the faculty of Howard University after a prominent right-wing donor at UNC opposed giving her tenure. What has been reported is that there was a great deal of political interference um, by conservatives who don't like the work that I've done, particularly the 1619 Project, and also by uh, the uh, powerful donor who gave the largest donation uh, in the 70-year history of the journalism school. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Haitian President Jovenel Moise was assassinated at his home early this morning. First Lady Martine Moise was also injured and has been hospitalized. President Moise had been in office since 2017, but faced large-scale protests from 2018 denouncing government corruption and demanding his resignation. Rights groups say he's responsible for the brutal crackdown on protesters and other government critics. Earlier this year, his opponents accused Moise of orchestrating a coup to stay in power beyond February 7th, when his term officially ended. But Moise clung to power with support from the Biden administration. Popular demonstrations against Moise had recently escalated. We'll have more on this breaking story after headlines. Here in New York City, the Associated Press called the Democratic primary race to become the city's next mayor for Brooklyn Borough President, former police captain Eric Adams. The latest tally, which accounts for most absentee ballots, saw Adams edge out former Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia by one percentage point, or just 8,426 votes. Adams, who would be the city's second black mayor, ran to the right of his party, promising to tackle crime. He's also known for supporting charter schools and the real estate industry. Meanwhile, updated tallies in the New York City Council races show women are on track to represent a majority for the first time ever. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones has rejected a tenure offer at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and will instead join the faculty of Howard University as the inaugural Knight Chair in Race and Journalism. Hannah Jones, who's best known for her work on the New York Times 1619 project, was originally denied tenure by UNC. On Tuesday, she spoke to CBS News's Gail King. What has been reported is that there was a great deal of political interference um, by conservatives who don't like the work that I've done, particularly the 1619 Project, and also by uh, the uh, powerful donor who gave the largest donation uh, in the 70-year history of the journalism school. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clear that my tenure was not taken up um, because of political opposition, uh, because of discriminatory views against my viewpoint uh, and, uh, I believe, my race and my gender. Nicole Hannah-Jones will be joined at Howard, a prominent historically black university, by the acclaimed author and journalist Tanahasi Coates. We'll have more on this story later in the broadcast. In immigration news, the Biden administration's extended temporary protected status, or TPS, to Yemeni nationals already in the U.S., citing the ongoing conflict and humanitarian crisis in their home country, where the U.N. estimates some 20 million people, many of them children, now rely on aid. And TPS will be extended for roughly 1,700 Yemenis through early March 2023. The current term was set to expire in September. 
The Pentagon announced it's canceling a contentious $10 billion contract for a cloud computing system known as Joint Enterprise Defense Infrastructure, or JEDI. The contract was granted to Microsoft in 2019, and Amazon sued, saying the decision was influenced by then-President Trump's animus towards Jeff Bezos, who stepped down earlier this week as Amazon's CEO. After Tuesday's announcement, Amazon's stock soared amid speculation the company would receive some or all of a new Pentagon contract. Bloomberg reports Bezos' personal wealth increased by $8.4 billion in one day. Top U.S. officials hosted the brother of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman Tuesday. The Biden administration had not publicly announced the visit by Deputy Defense Minister Prince Khalid bin Salman amidst ongoing pressure to reevaluate the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. An intelligence report released in February found that Mohammed bin Salman directly approved the assassination of Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki told reporters Tuesday the U.S. was reaffirming its commitment to the nation's longstanding partnership and Saudi defense. The United Nations is warning over three-quarters of households in Lebanon do not have enough food or money to buy food, as the social, political and economic crises continue to spiral there. The devastating recession and inflation has led the currency to plunge by 90 percent, forcing over half the population into poverty and facing major food and fuel shortages. The World Bank's calling the situation in Lebanon one of the worst economic depressions of modern history. The European Union threatened sanctions last month if the country's leaders could not quickly form a new government and enact reforms. Caretaker Prime Minister Hassan Diab, who resigned from his premiership following the tragic explosion at the port of Beirut last August, issued another dire warning this week. I call on the United Nations, all international agencies, the international community, and worldwide public opinion to help save the Lebanese people from dying and prevent the demise of Lebanon. Lebanon is a few days away from the social explosion. The Lebanese are facing this dark fate alone. In Israel, the recently formed government of far-right Prime Minister Naftali Bennett failed to extend an apartheid law that denies citizenship and even residency to Palestinians from the occupied territories who are married to Israelis. The racist law had been extended every year since it was enacted in 2003. The law failed to pass after former leader Benjamin Netanyahu's party and his allies voted against it to undermine the ruling coalition, which ousted him last month. In Iran, the outgoing government is hosting talks between the Taliban negotiators and Afghan government officials as the U.S. closes in on completing its withdrawal from Afghanistan, and as Taliban forces continue to make major territorial advances. Tens of thousands of families have fled their homes in recent weeks. Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif said Afghans must now make difficult decisions for the future of their country after two decades of failed U.S. intervention. In India, the U.N. is denouncing the recent death of 84-year-old Indian rights activist and Jesuit priest Father Stan Swamy. Swami had been charged under India's contested anti-terror law. He was arrested last year over his advocacy work fighting for tribal rights, accused of having ties to a radical left-wing group, which the Indian police alleged instigated violence in 2018. He died in a hospital in Mumbai Monday, ahead of a bail hearing. He'd been denied bail before, despite having health issues, including Parkinson's disease. This is Sitaram Yachuri, a leader of India's Communist Party. I would consider this virtually debt under custody, and under custody by a government who, on charges that had not been even established or even, even proved to be taken up, he's been under detention for more than eight months. In Mexico, human rights advocates are demanding justice for another indigenous land defender assassinated in the southern state of Chiapas. Simon Pedro Perez Lopez was gunned down early Monday morning as he walked to a local market with his son. 
Perez López was the former president of Las Abejas de Acteal, an anti-violence group that defended indigenous communities and their land. In Colombia, 10 military members and one civilian have been accused of murdering at least 120 people and forcibly disappearing two dozen others and falsely claiming their victims were guerrilla members who had been killed in combat. Tuesday's indictment marks the first time Colombia's Special Jurisdiction for Peace Tribunal charged military members involved in what's known as the false positive scandal, where thousands of extrajudicial killings were falsely portrayed as leftist rebels who died in combat. The false positives were meant to help give a sense of the Colombian military's victory in the half-century U.S.-backed conflict against the FARC. That's the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. This is Catalina Diaz, a judge with Colombia's Peace Tribunal. We have found that it was a pattern of macro criminality, which is to say the repetition of at least 120 murders during two years in the same region by the same group of people associated with a criminal organization and following the same modus operandi. The tribunal was created after a peace deal was signed in Colombia in 2016. To see our interview with Mario Mario yesterday, you can go to democracynow.org. In Nigeria, at least 140 children went missing after gunmen raided a boarding school in Kaduna State Monday in the 10th mass kidnapping to be recorded in northwest Nigeria since December. Also Monday, our men kidnapped at least eight people, including a one-year-old from a hospital staff residence in Kaduna. The U.N. says the mounting attacks are leading fearful parents to keep their kids out of school, compounding the edgenal educational crisis in Nigeria, where 13.2 million children do not attend school. This is UNICEF representative Peter Hawkins. It really is of, of concern that uh, the this has become a money-spinning exercise, uh, where uh, schools have become an easy target for kidnappers, and resources have become available uh, to, to pay the, the kidnappers off. Nigeria is Africa's most populous country. In the Netherlands, renowned crime reporter Peter R. de Vries is in critical condition after he was shot in downtown Amsterdam Tuesday. De Vries was attacked as he left a television studio. A video circulating on social media shows the award-winning journalist laying on the street as blood pools around his head. At least two suspects are in custody. The 64-year-old is a household name in the Netherlands and has investigated cold case killings and reported on organized crime for decades. He'd received death threats in the past and was previously given police protection. In 2008, de Vries won an international Emmy for investigating the 2005 disappearance of U.S. teenager Natalie Holloway in the Caribbean island of Aruba. The European Union has enacted a ban on 10 of the most commonly consumed single-use plastics, including straws, plastic plates, cutlery and cotton swabs. The law also directs companies to use more recycled plastics in disposable drinking bottles. But environmental activists say the measure doesn't go far enough and allows for individual countries to adopt their own laws, which in some cases are much weaker. And in Canada, a marine biologist said last week's record-shattering climate change-fueled heat wave may have killed over one billion sea creatures on the Salish Sea coastline, such as mussels, starfish and barnacles. Dead shellfish were also found in the Pacific Northwest. This comes as more areas around the globe report new heat records. Finland's Arctic Lapland hit its hottest temperature in over a century, at 90%. 92.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, we go to Haiti, where the president has been assassinated. Stay with us. Passé, Haïti a fait bac. Jardin séché, du monde a fait mourir. Quelle injustice, quoi, peut valer pitié? Pays à 
What is to be done? This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show with breaking news. Haitian President Jovenel Moise was assassinated early today after an attack on his home in the outskirts of Port-au-Prince. Moise's wife was also shot in the attack. She's been hospitalized. In a statement, the Haitian prime minister, Claude Joseph, said, quote, a group of unidentified individuals, some of them speaking Spanish, attacked the private residence of the president of the republic and thus fatally wounded the head of state, unquote. Moise had led Haiti since 2017. Earlier this year, critics of Moise accused him of orchestrating a coup to stay in power beyond February 7th, when his term officially ended. For months, Haitians have staged large protests against Moise, demanding he leave office. But Moise clung to power with support from the Biden administration, which backed Moise's claim that his term should end next year. Human rights groups report had accused Moise of sanctioning attacks against civilians in impoverished neighborhoods of Port-au-Prince, the capital, with targeted assassinations and threats against government critics carried out with impunity. We're joined now, dealing with this breaking news, by two guests. Dahoud André is a longtime Haitian community activist and member of the Committee to Mobilize Against Dictatorship in Haiti. And Kim Ives is with us, the editor of Haiti Liberté. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's begin with Daoud André. Can you tell us what you have heard? Uh, who is responsible for this assassination? And then give us um, what has been happening. Talk about what has been happening in Haiti. Well, thank you very much, uh, Amy and Juan, for uh, inviting us to speak about what's happening in Haiti. We got the call, uh, a call about uh, 5.30 this morning, uh, to say that radio in Haiti had reported that overnight uh, Jovenel Moise had been assassinated. I should say that uh, in Right now, as, as of now, we have no clue e, where this assassination came from. Certainly not the street gangs such as the G9, e, Jimmy Barbecue Cherizier, who e, has been going around recently after years of e, demonstrating with a, an American flag behind his back and right now purporting to be a fighting for a revolution to liberate the Haitian people. So we know it did not come from there. We know that uh, it could have come from the oligarchy, uh, such people as uh, uh, Reginald Boulos, maybe, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Dimitri Vorb, that at present, it appears that Jovenel Moise has some difficulty with them, because we can imagine that it would take a lot of money to do and resources to do an operation such as this. But a lot of people that I've spoken to this morning are saying it, it's probably the U.S. government, again, a, a, not just affirming their domination over uh, uh, Haiti right now, but maybe to mask the shame of their uh, defeat and uh, running away from Afghanistan in the middle of the night. 
And, and Kim Ives, I wanted to get your your perspective uh, on this. Uh, clearly, there was a popular opposition uh, and questions, deep questions about any kind of legitimacy for Jovenel Moïse. So, uh, is it was this a potentially a falling out among the elite, or uh, or did, or was there? A, foreign involvement as well, uh, other than the p possible mercenaries themselves being hired from abroad? Well, it uh, definitely seems there was foreign involvement. Uh, my sources in Haiti this morning tell me that uh, the assailants, the killers, uh, arrived in nine brand new Nissan Patrol uh, pickups. Uh, they had a complete understanding of the uh, household of uh, Jovenel Moise, so apparently they had some inside uh, information. Um, they uh, knew what they were doing. They pretended to be the DEA. Uh, so uh, clearly this was a fairly sophisticated operation. Was it Boulos? Was it uh, one of the other uh, uh, members of the bourgeoisie? who have had problems with Jovenel, it's difficult to know. It seems he also was recently in Turkey making some deals, uh, and the Colombians may have not been happy about that. Uh, that's one of the rumors going around. So we have to wait and see uh, who was behind it. But definitely on the street, um, things have been very hot. The, uh, the revolutionary forces of the G9 uh, family and allies uh, have uh, basically been also calling for uh, Jovenel to go. So I don't think there's anybody that uh, is going to be uh, 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 unhappy with this uh, outcome. Uh, it was uh, a time when he was very isolated, um, even within his own uh, circles. And the fact that they were speaking I Spanish? Yeah, and that's that's the big question. Yeah, I, I'm trying to find out wh why they think it was Colombians involved. Uh, I don't know if it's an accent question. I haven't gotten an answer back, but I believe that um, you know it was definitely uh, 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 some fairly uh, sophisticated mercenary operation involved. And Dawood, I wanted to ask you, in terms of, uh, for those uh, listeners and viewers of Democracy Now!, who have not been closely following what's been going on uh, in Haiti in, in recent years, could you talk about the connections of uh, uh, Moise to the previous president and the involvement of the uh, the Clintons in the, the continuing persistent political crises that uh, have occurred in Haiti in recent years? Yeah, I want to point out first that uh, this is exactly three years since the major uprisings that happened in the country uh, in 2018, July 6th, 7th, when uh, the IMF had demanded uh, that uh, Haiti, the government of Haiti, raise fuel prices. And some of these prices were doubled, and the uh, puppet government that Jovenel Moïse headed, they did this in the middle of a soccer game between Brazil and Belgium. And the idea was that Brazil would win and that it would be a euphoria and the people wouldn't mind, they wouldn't notice, they wouldn't be, they would be celebrating Brazil's victory. And fate had it that Brazil lost shamefully. And immediately after the game ended, uprisings all over the country. So it's important to note this uh, date, that uh, this anniversary, and that Jovenel Moïse would be killed uh, on this anniversary. But also, uh, I want to point out that what Kim Ives is calling the revolutionary forces of the G9 and Jimmy Cherizier, these are criminals. These are people that are responsible for killing massacres in poor neighborhoods in the country. These are people, and a lot of people find it amazing, unbelievable, that Kim Ives and his newspaper, IT Liberté, would be defending it, trying to uh, make people believe that these are revolutionaries. These are the people who are throwing 78-year-old 
uh, elderly folks off of buildings, burning them alive, that these are the people who are going to save us. The audience should understand, yes, uh, Martelly was uh, handpicked by the Clintons as a, you know, a puppet, as someone who would do their bidding. And during the campaign, it was obvious that the Clintons, Bill Clinton, who was running the CIRH to supposedly rebuild Haiti back better, same slogan that Joe Biden used in his recent campaign, that they would find that this is the person who would be a, a degenerate. Someone, I, I know that uh, this program has done much about Matelli, so I don't want to even go there. But what is uh, important is that Matelli handpicked Jovenel Moïse. And Jovenel Moïse, who was a crook, an indicted, a fake entrepreneur, was put in directly by the U.S. government again. And in that position, he was a reliable a, a puppet to, Joe, a, to first Donald Trump, to the point that he betrayed Haiti's historic relationship with Venezuela in recognizing Juan Guaido as legitimate head of Venezuela. And Jovenel Moïse had the nerve to a, say that a, the most recent legislative elections in Venezuela, they were, he would not recognize them because there was not enough a, popular participation. And this is someone who, by their own numbers, got about 500,000 votes in a country of 12 million people. So uh, the, the, I, I need to say that the Haitian people loathed uh, Jovenel Moïse and Martelly, uh, the PHTK government, because they uh, are the tools of the United States they, uh, to uh, impose the will of the United States on the people. And they armed these street gangs, they financed these massacres in the poor neighborhoods that are supportive of, a, I should say, President Aristide, the Lavalas government. And a, they just felt, and this was Martelly's position, he clearly said, so long as the heavyweights, meaning the United States, the UN, the OAS, the core group, supported him and Jovenel Moïse, nothing could happen to them. And this is what we have seen. Um, the support, the uh, in, uh, unequivocal support of the United States to the PHTK government, who was killing the Haitian people and stealing the resources of the country. I want to get Kim I's response um, to this clip. One of Haiti's most powerful gang leaders warned this week he was launching a revolution against the country's business and political elites. This is Jimmy Charissier, uh, who Daou just referred to, a.k.a. Barbecue, a former police officer who heads the so-called G9 Federation of Nine Gangs formed last year. I'm telling people to keep looking for what belongs to them by right. It is your money, which is in the banks, stores, supermarkets and dealerships. So go and get what is rightfully yours. Continue looking for what belongs to us, because it is ours. Can you tell us who uh, barbecue Jimmy Charissier is, Kim Ives, and respond to Daoud's criticism of your paper, Haiti Liberté? Yes, I can. Uh, Haiti Liberté, of which, by the way, I'm just the English language section editor, uh, has um, been following with very great interest uh, the emergence of uh, the G9. Uh, unlike Daoud, Andre, I have met with uh, Jimmy Cherizier and uh, a number of the uh, organizations on the ground in Haiti. The uh, uh, massacres that he's describing are really the product principally of an outfit called the RNDDH the uh, Haitian Network for the Defense of Human Rights in Haiti, headed by a guy called Pierre Esperance, who also issued um, fallacious reports against the Aristide government after the uh, 2004 coup d'etat. Um, he has um, 
basically waged some kind of holy war against uh, Jimmy Cherizier, who, according to Cherizier, he asked to bump off, to rub out a, a rival a human rights group head. Uh, so Jimmy Cherizier was a, a stellar policeman uh, who was basically radicalized by his betrayal by the Haitian police uh, leadership, who uh, hung him out to dry after a... Um, uh, operation went badly in Grand Ravine in 2017. And he was uh, dealing with some of the leading lights of the opposition, Reginald Boulos, previously mentioned, a guy called Yuri Latortu, who is also an alleged uh, former death squad leader and uh, was called the poster boy for political corruption by the U.S. Embassy itself in the uh, WikiLeaks cables that we uh, released a decade ago. Uh, so he soured on them, too, and he saw that both the uh, government of Jovenel Moise and the opposition, the bourgeois opposition with which uh, Daoud is aligned, uh, were rotten. And he said, we need a revolution because the people need schools. They need uh, clinics. They need uh, uh, sanitation. He, he took me around the neighborhoods of Delma 4, Delma 2, Delma 6, where he grew up. He's a street, uh, the son of a poor street vendor. And he showed me how people had to uh, do their toilet in a plastic bag and throw it in a canal. And he said, you know, people can't live like this. So he has been calling for a revolution against the system in Haiti and is being radicalized really by the day and by these events. Uh, so uh, the, the portrayal of him in the mainstream press, in the, you know, by the AP, the Washington Post, is he's this uh, gang leader. He's the boogeyman. But the reality is on the ground that this is an uprising, really, of Haiti's lumpen proletariat, which has been uh, crushed uh, over the past <laughs> decades. And uh, Jovenel Moise was no different, and Martelly. And uh, the people... Uh, it, it, the masses in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince, uh, now some three million, four million people have had enough and are rising up. Uh, Daoud, and your response uh, on the issue of uh, uh, Kim saying that you, you are representing more of the uh, <laughs> of the bourgeois opposition. <laughs> Kim Ives is a joke, and it's sad that uh, your program is giving him this platform to, uh, again, push this garbage that Jimmy Cherizier, who, and this is not the RNDDH who's saying that Cherizier, that barbecue uh, is uh, an assassin, a criminal, like someone who is responsible for all of these massacres. And despite the denunciations of the people of La Saline, of all of these poor neighborhoods in Bel Air, who themselves, they say that it is Jimmy Cherizier. This is RNDDH. This is Fondation et Jeclere. This is the CARDH and the people in the streets and any radio station in the country that you turn on and people who are massacred are speaking directly about who they saw came with guns, with gasoline, and fire to burn down their homes. So now, uh, to say that uh, Dawood Andre is aligned with the bourgeoisie opposition, <laughs> uh, uh, there is a, a former ally of uh, Kim Ives and his newspaper, Haiti Liberté, that he owns. Uh, but Kim is a white man an American, and so he cannot come to this program or anywhere else and say that he is the owner, the puppet master of this newspaper, so he's pretending that he's just... But I'm sure that Amy Goodman, Juan Gonzalez, and everyone else who knows about this newspaper knows who owns this newspaper and knows that this is just another a wannabe white savior for the people. And it's beautiful, the song that you started this segment with, eh, Amy, because this is a song called Kisapunfe, What is to be done? 
as you said. And the song, if you continued to play it, it would say it's a revolution. And who's going to make this revolution? The Haitian people. It is not our neighbors. It is not wannabe white saviors like Kim Ives who are going to liberate the Haitian people. I want to speak a little bit about, like, it, it, this this thing, the Jovenel Moïse. This is what this is about. And I should say, if I knew that I was going to be putting this a program together with Kim Ives, I wouldn't even come on. And uh, you should go to Haiti. You've been to Haiti, Amy, one. And go speak to someone like Oxygen David, who worked for years with Kim Ives. Go speak to Mario Joseph, who is, was close collaborator of Kim Ives, who are both denouncing him and his newspaper in Haiti for pushing this garbage that is scum, like a, a Jimmy Cherizier, who are mur he's not going to Pétionville to a Thomasin to kill the rich people, to steal from them, the people he has massacred for the government. And this is why, for three years, the Jovenel government has never executed their warrants against Cherizier, because he is in their pocket. He's someone who's working for them. And find his previous uh, messages on social media, where he has this same Jimmy Shazier, an American flag behind his back to show the world who he stands with. And now uh, that, that he would, has that some little can, trouble uh, with his we, people, uh, uh, we, can, we have only a, a couple more minutes. To... Leading revolution. Yeah. That would, we have the only a couple more minutes to go. I wanted to get okay. uh, so, I wanted to get mm -hmm. Kim Ives in for uh, to respond uh, briefly, Kim, and also if you could mention uh, talk about how the Biden administration has been dealing with Haiti since it's come into office. Yes. Uh, well, um, just to finish with Daoud, he's had a long time bugaboo with uh, Haiti Liberté. I imagined he might explode on the show <laughs> uh, uh, if coupled with me. Uh, his um, belief that I'm the uh, owner of Haiti Liberté is as unfounded as his uh, uh, rumors that he's saying about uh, the G9 and uh, uh, Jimmy Cherizier or my relationship with Oxygen David and Mario Joseph, who I have only recently spoken to as well. Uh, so this is, um, you know, just typical. But uh, as for the Biden administration, the uh, administration has, according to my sources in Haiti, been uh, totally supporting uh, Jovenel up until now. But Helen Lalim, who heads the BNU, which is the UN office in Haiti, uh, uh, has been uh, very much uh, on the fence, really, about uh, whether to go over to the bourgeois opposition and use them for a transition. Well, obviously, that probably is going to happen now because uh, uh, the president <laughs> no longer is living. Uh, but uh, so the Biden administration has been having this slightly contradictory uh, sort of uh, message where on the one hand they say, you know, we're going to support Jovenel and he uh, can be in office until February 7th, 2022. But at the same time, they're saying we're alarmed by authoritarianism and uh, the decrees that he's passing. So um, uh, right now, we'll see which way they go. Will they move over to the opposition, which basically is headed by this fellow, Yuri Latortu, who we have uh, done uh, WikiLeaks articles on, on Haiti Liberté. People can check those out uh, a decade ago. And uh, I expect that... Um, you know, they may try to find some sort of compromise candidate, somebody with a slight Lavalas color, a slight progressive color to be the uh, figurehead of this transitional government. But uh, um, I, don't, I don't think they'll be able to go forward with uh, the, the remnants of the crew that uh, Jovenel had working with him now. They just appointed a new uh, prime minister on Monday, a guy called Dr. Ariel Henry who is an old, uh, basically, a collaborator of the U.S. in Haiti. He sat on the Council of the Wise, uh, which facilitated the transfer 
to uh, the de facto government after the uh, uh, coup d'etat against Aristide on February 29th, 2004. And uh, so he uh, was uh, basically named on Monday, but I see that it's Claude Joseph, the interim prime minister, who is doing all the talking uh, after this uh, assassination of Jovenel. Well, we're going to leave it there. And, of course, these are just the first few hours after the assassination of the Haitian president. Um, and we will continue to cover what develops since um, from this time. Kim Ives, editor of Haiti Liberté, and Daoud André, longtime Haitian community activist and member of the Committee to Mobilize Against Dictatorship in Haiti. Next up, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones has rejected the tenure offer from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill after major controversy. She's joining the faculty of Howard University after a prominent right-wing donor at UNC opposed giving her tenure. Stay with us. Now we've been beaut, and we've been scorned. We've been talked about, sure as you born, but we'll never turn back. No, we'll never turn back. Until we walk in peace, we have walked through the shadows of death. But we'll never turn back. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Here in New York City, the Associated Press called the Democratic primary race to become the city's next mayor. For Brooklyn, borough president and former police captain Eric Adams. The latest tally, which accounts for most absentee ballots, saw Adams edge out former Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia by one percentage point. That's a little over 8,000 votes. Adams, who would be the city's second black mayor, ran to the right of his party, promising to tackle crime. He's also known for supporting charter schools and the real estate industry, and taking on racism in the police department of New York. Meanwhile, updated tallies in the city council races show women are on track to represent a majority of the New York City Council for the first time ever. Before we go to our final story, Nicole Hannah-Jones moving to Howard University, rejecting um, tenure from UNC, her alma mater. Juan, can you talk about the significance of, um, of Eric Adams uh, take, winning the Democratic primary? He'll then go up against Curtis Sliwa, the Republican choice. Yes, Amy. Well, as we discussed uh, uh, a few weeks ago on the show, it seemed most likely that Adams would prevail, given his initial lead, and it turned out to be so in terms of the counts of the absentee ballots. It was a very close uh, race, but then again, there were many candidates in this race. Uh, so I think the uh, he's he, he's uh, likely to become the second uh, African American mayor in the history of uh, New York City, uh, and as I mentioned before, I've known Eric Adams for about 30 years now. He was a big source of mine.
I, when I was a reporter on issues uh, within the police department and and uh, uh, waged the valiant fight back in those days against racism and police abuse within the department, became increasingly conservative as he became a politician. Uh, so I think that uh, the, re the real story here, I think, is that in the last year or two, there has been a considerable increase in gun violence and crime across the United States. Uh, I believe a lot of it is police departments standing down uh, in uh, in response to the massive public criticism around the country and 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 more and more guns being funneled into uh, uh, black and brown communities and Adams then was able to capture the majority of the democratic uh, electorate uh, in the primary as a result of the concern that they that uh, the defund the police movement had got, was going too far uh, and that they uh, that the voters especially in the black and brown communities overwhelmed supported him. So I think that uh, that's the key uh, lesson from this. But I think that Adams will be uh, not as conservative uh, as a lot of people think, but definitely not nearly as progressive as some of the other candidates. Well, and of course, we'll continue to cover what happens here in New York City. But now we're turning to Nicole Hannah-Jones. After months of controversy, the acclaimed journalist in The New York Times announced Tuesday she's decided not to join the faculty at her alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill. Instead, the Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter will join the faculty at Howard University, the prestigious, historically black university where the Knight Foundation has established a tenured, endowed professorship in race and journalism for her. She also plans to create the Center for Journalism and Democracy. Acclaimed journalist ta Coates, who's a Howard alum and close friend of Hannah Jones, will join her at the school in running the center. The decision by Hannah Jones comes after her tenure was initially denied by the University of North Carolina Board of Trustees in May, after it was first unanimously approved by the faculty. The board typically rubber stamps tenure for professors who've won such approval from their peers. The decision to deny her tenure was reversed last Monday after massive protests from alumni, faculty and students. Nicole Hannah-Jones spoke Tuesday on CBS This Morning with host Gail King about her decision to decline the tenured professorship at UNC Chapel Hill. This was a position that, since the 1980s, came with tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, the night chairs are designed for professional journalists who have been working in the field to come into academia. And every other chair before me, who also happened to be white, received that position with tenure. Mm -hmm. I it had never that. been denied. No one had never. ever been denied tenure before. Exactly. And I went through the tenure process, and I received the unanimous approval of the faculty uh, to be granted tenure. And so to be denied it and to only have that vote occur on the last possible day, at the last possible moment, after threat of legal action, after weeks of protest, after it became a national scandal, it's just not something that I want anymore. Nicole Hannah-Jones is best known for her work at The New York Times, where she produced the 1619 Project, an interactive project that reexamines the legacy of slavery. She's won the Pulitzer Prize for her work. She told CBS this morning why she thinks the UNC um, uh, denied her tenure. What has been reported is that there was a great deal of political interference um, by conservatives who don't like the work that I've done, particularly the 1619 Project, and also by uh, the uh, powerful donor who gave the largest donation uh, in the 70-year history of the journalism school. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clear that my tenure was not taken up um, because of political opposition, uh, because of discriminatory views against my viewpoint uh, and, uh, I believe, my race and my gender. For more, we're joined in Greensboro, North Carolina, by Joe Kelly, an investigative reporter for NC Policy Watch, uh, who Nicole Hannah-Jones credited with breaking the story about the, quote, discrimination I faced in the UNC tenure debacle, she said. His latest story is an exclusive print interview with her headline, Nicole Hannah-Jones declines UNC tenure offer heads to Howard University. Welcome to Democracy Now! Um, <clears throat> we're talking about one of the the oldest public university in the United States, Joe Killian. Take us through it, what happened, and who the donor is, this critical point um, that the university's uh, journalism school is named for, who intervened in this process. Sure. Well, 
it's a little oversimplistic to say she was denied tenure because it actually was much more unusual than that. They actually just decided not to vote on it, which is something you see in politics, not usually in academia. Uh, killing something in a committee, making sure it never comes out of a committee, never comes to a vote, nobody's on record publicly one way or the other. That's something you see at the North Carolina General Assembly. It's something you see at city councils and county commissioner meetings. It's not generally something you see on a butt board of trustees of a major university. And that's what happened here. Uh, and our reporting revealed that not only was there conservative uh, backlash to the idea of her working at the university uh, from conservative activists and elected Republicans, but also from uh, Walter Hussman, who is a uh, Arkansas media magnate and graduate graduate of the uh, of the journalism school, who gave twenty five million dollars in twenty nineteen, uh, which led to the school being named after him and the school agreeing to etch what he calls his core values of journalism into a wall at the at the university. Uh, he was he, I, I interviewed Hussman and he said that he uh, had concerns about the 1619 project and also about an essay that uh, Hannah Jones wrote on the idea of reparations for black Americans for slavery. And he took those concerns uh, all the way up the chain. He, he didn't get the answer that he wanted from the school's dean who said, thank you for your input, but we're going to make the decision ourselves. So he went to the, the chancellor, he went to the vice chancellor who oversees uh, financial giving and at least one member of the board of trustees itself. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you, this whole issue of uh, tenure for uh, a uh, uh, faculty, we've seen several battles now in recent years about uh, prestigious universities uh, not approving tenure for prominent uh, black and Latino scholars. Um, how, what do you say to people who say these are basically uh, tempests in a teapot? that these are middle-class intellectuals uh, seeking to get approval of a permanent job, lifetime job, uh, as tenure is uh, in these universities, when millions of Americans are, uh, want, want just a decent paying job not, and can't dream of having lifetime tenure. How important are these battles in terms of the, uh, the, the battles over institutional racism in a society right now? I think it's a microcosm of a lot of things we're seeing in the nation, right? Uh, at public universities, certainly at the University of North Carolina system and UNC Chapel Hill, its flagship institution, these organizations are, uh, their, their boards, their governing boards are all political appointees. So the UNC Board of Governors, for instance, which governs the entire UNC system and all of its schools, has one Democrat right now because Republicans in the North Carolina General Assembly do the appointing. Uh, that Democrat is a, a Democrat who lost, who was a, a lawmaker and lost his primary, uh, primarily because of siding very often with conservatives and Republicans. So that's who they put on the on the board there. The uh, the board at Chapel Hill is stacked with white men. It's stacked with people who are conservative, uh, and it doesn't look anything like the the university itself. It, you know, is the question of tenure and whether you get a tenure appointment a, a champagne problem? I think it it might seem that way for many people, but Nicole Hannah-Jones doesn't come from uh, an, an, ivory, an ivory tower background. She doesn't come from an upper middle class background. She's from Waterloo, Iowa. She grew up in a working class community where she didn't know black people who went to college. She went to Notre Dame. She went to UNC for grad school. She worked her way up from uh, the Chapel Hill News in North Carolina up to the New York Times and won Peabody Polk National Magazine Awards, the Pulitzer. Uh, along the way. So when you see somebody uh, doing what conservatives say that they should do, lift themselves up by their bootstraps, achieve uh, in America, and they, they hit a sort of a glass ceiling for ideological reasons, I think that's a problem that should concern everyone. I want to turn to two clips, one the mega donor and then the protester, who at this point might have more power. This is UNC mega donor Walter Hussman speaking in a 2019 video about his $25 million namesake donation to the UNC Hussman School of Journalism and Media. We're investing in Carolina and journalism because it's a very important time in America. Americans are beginning to realize they need to trust a trusted source of professional journalism.
And now I want to turn to a student. When black students tried to attend the UNC Board of Trustees meeting on Wednesday, June 30th, where members voted on whether to grant tenure to Nicole Hannah-Jones, campus police forcibly removed the students from the room. This is UNC student Talia Javan, one of the protesters in that clip, speaking on Black News, Black News Tonight with Mark Lamont Hill about whether UNC is a place where she wants to be now. They feel they can do anything to us, treat us any kind of way. I want you all to ask yourselves, honestly, this is what we saw them do today on camera and they knew the world was watching. How do you honestly think they treat us when you're not paying attention? I will never, ever, ever forget the lesson that UNC at Chapel Hill taught me today. And I will continue to bring this up when I'm talking to potential black students who are interested in coming here in the future. Now, UNC police chief uh, Chapel Hill has resigned um, after what happened at that trustee meeting. Joe Killian, take us from there. The power of Hussman, the power of the protesters. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I think that what you're seeing in that protest clip is a lot of pent up frustration over a, a number of issues dealing with politics and race at the university for years where students and faculty and staff members of color do not feel they've been heard uh, and uh, have had conflict with the people who are governing the university, governing the university system, who uh, are very, very removed from uh, who it is that is attending the university and who teaches at the university, who the alumni are. Uh, if you just look at the, the, the makeup, the social makeup, the racial and ethnic makeup of, of these boards, they just don't reflect the students. And, and ideologically, they certainly don't represent the students. So there's a, a terrific amount of frustration built up. Uh, as to uh, how much influence they have, I mean, I think that this, this incident proves that when the campus sort of speaks as one, uh, faculty, uh, staff, students, alumni, uh, major, fa major funders of the university, they can get the attention of the people who are in charge. But you know, can they make real change? Uh, you know, that's a harder question. Only the members of the North Carolina General Assembly can change the leadership of these boards. And um, the people coming in are, are not any less conservative. In fact, I would say that many of them are more conservative than the people who are leaving. And and I wanted to ask you in terms of the impact of this night, uh, uh, this night foundation money, which uh, supposedly is also uh, attracting uh, other foundations, the Ford Foundation and others, for a multi-million dollar grant to Howard University. What the impact is going to be uh, of that decision of these major foundations uh, to, in essence, uh, provide an alternative to what UNC was uh, so late in granting to uh, uh, in, t in terms of tenure here? Yeah, this is not the first time we've seen this either. Uh, UNC lost a, a major grant uh, after its uh, debacle over the Silent Sam Confederate Monument on its campus and how it handled that. Uh, and it, it continues to uh, come into conflict with major donors and to lose donors and uh, money from individual individuals who donate to the school, um, you know, to which, honestly, some of the folks who are running the school and running the university say, OK, that's fine. We're, we're doing it what it is we want to do. And we believe that we'll, you know, continue to find the money to do that. But we're, you know, we're not interested in changing direction because these people who fund our work don't like how we're, we're managing things. Students toppled the statue, the Confederate statue, in 2018. Now uh, the UNC press is in the crosshairs of the Board of Governors, which is refusing to reappoint Professor Eric Muller, um, who criticized the handling of the silent stem statue. We have five seconds. <laughs> yeah, Eric Muller is a renowned UNC law professor who has been on the UNC press board for two terms. He was— Three seconds. Expected to be Expected to be reappointed, uh, was not reappointed, and has uh, butted heads with the Board of Governors. We'll leave it there. Joe Killian, thanks for joining us.